Thanks for tuning into this Revision Zone Maths video. In this video, we're going to be differentiating parametric functions. Indeed, before we start to differentiate parametric functions, we need to get an understanding of exactly what parametric functions are. And there is actually a lot to get through uh, because to get a thorough understanding of what these things are, we need to sort of build ideas up. So I'm going to have to introduce things that we should already be familiar with, but we really need to keep at the forefront of our minds as we work through this content on parametric functions. So let's start with just the definition of a function. We have the definition here. A function is just a mathematical machine which takes in well-defined inputs and gives out well-defined outputs. So the well-defined part here is quite important. Uh, and the second thing we need to keep in mind, importantly, is a function can only give one output for one input. OK, so you can't have a case where you put one thing into the function, like you put one number in and the function throws out three, four, five or seven numbers. Right. So a function should only throw out one output for each input. Let's look at some very basic examples. So we've got f of x equals x squared. That's a standard function, obviously, uh, where x can be any real number. So this is basically our input. So when we stick a real number into f, uh, the function squares it and then uh, the answer is our output. And we can normally go and label the output to be y. So we can say y is actually our output. And unsurprisingly, in this case, for every real number that you put in, because squaring it would always make it positive, then y has to be uh, non-negative, OK? But the key idea is for each number you put in, you only get one number out, right? Let's consider a non-example of a function. So this thing here is a non-function which is uh, if I put a real number in or say a positive number in rather and we square root it and the square root can be either positive or negative or both. Right. So this is this is most certainly not uh, a function. Why is it not a function? Because if we consider the example, if we put four into the function, I'm calling it a function, even though it's not a function. If we put four into F, uh, then we square root four, we get two. But obviously the plus and minus means that we actually get two outputs. We get a plus two and we got a minus two. And that violates the definition of a function. So even though this thing may look like a function, it's actually not a function. Now, on the A-level syllabus, the vast majority of functions one would come across are where, where you're taking in some real numbers and you're throwing out some real numbers, right? But not all functions are like that. In fact, the vast majority of most interesting functions do not just take in real numbers and throw out real numbers. They do, they do other stuff. So there are functions that would take in real numbers and throw out vectors. There are functions that would take in vectors and throw out vectors. There are all sorts of wacky functions that do all sorts of interesting and wonderful things. Uh, for our purposes, however, parametric functions would be an example of one of the first things we'll see on the A-level syllabus where we sort of stick in real numbers, but then we don't get out real numbers, we get out points, right? I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But before we, we, we move on to that, uh, let us just consider a real interesting fact about uh, real functions. So what do I mean by real functions? I just mean functions of the sort that we've actually seen already, which is you put in a real number and you get out a real number. So the fact here actually says that all real functions obey the vertical line test. Now, what do I mean by the vertical line test? So if we go and plot a function, right? So we might have uh, X and Y and say, say the function looks, looks like this, this sort of thing. OK, so this is, this is a function. And suppose we, we so somehow plot something else where I just tell you that actually it's going to look a little bit like that. OK. And again, you might say, well, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that looks very much like a function. So I'm just going to call it uh, a function. Now, the claim here is uh, this one here on the left would pass the vertical line test, but this one here on the right would not pass the vertical line test. What do I mean by the vertical line test? So what I mean by the vertical line test is if I go to any X value and if I just do a dotted vertical line, I would find that the dotted vertical line would only meet my 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 curve once right so and, and you can do this on basically for any x value and you'll find that uh, the dotted line will only meet the curve once okay now what does that mean what that means is this tells me that for each input there is actually one output okay and in fact because we can do this at every point on this on this curve 
then that tells me for each input there is effectively only one output, right? Whereas if you now come to the case on the right hand side, there certainly are points that when you put one input in, you only get one output out. That's completely fine. But there are also other x values for when you put an input in and you and you draw a vertical line, you actually don't get one output out, you get multiple output outs. So in this particular case, there are apparently three outputs for for this. If I put this x as x1 in, then I've actually got a y1 here. I've got a y2 here and I've got a y3 here. So somehow this thing here is throwing out three three outputs apparently for, for one input. So technically that's not really a function, right? So what does a vertical line test actually tells us? The vertical line test tells us a way of just being able to look at a graph of something, uh, provided the something that we're actually looking at the graph of are supposed to be real functions. And then we can say whether it actually technically satisfies the definition of a function or not, right? So the, the function on the left is actually a proper function, whereas the thing on the right is actually not a function. Before moving on, I must add that there are actually lots of standard techniques for being able to convert uh, things that are like functions, but technically not functions, into functions, right? So for example, in this case here, of our example of a non-function, what we might actually want to do is we might want to split this up to say, let's define f of x to be uh, root x, the positive one, and say, let's call it f1, and let's call f2 x to be the negative square root of x, right? So in this case now, uh, you can sort of check for yourself, uh, this is completely well defined and it will only give one output, and likewise in that case. So we started with something which technically wasn't a function because it was giving multiple outputs, but obviously just a small sort of a change would allow us to still, still describe the sort of thing we wanted to describe, but now in mathematically rigorous way such that it satisfies the definition of a function. Now let's move on to the next part of the video so we can actually see why this knowledge of, on functions is actually quite important. So as a way of motivating the need for parametric functions, let's consider this example. So we have an equation, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. You should be able to recognize this equation as describing uh, a circle of center zero and radius r. And in particular, if we take r to be one, then we end up with this equation here, which is of course describing a unit circle. We have a graph of a unit circle here, as you can see. Now uh, let's apply the vertical line test to this. So if we take x equals a half as input and just draw a vertical line, to see uh, what happens, we see that the vertical line is going to cross our graph twice, which means in fact somehow for one input there are two outputs if we think of it as a real function, right? This is also visible from the fact that if we start with the equation of a circle, it can be rearranged to sort of be put in a form where we have two outputs coming out simultaneously, right? Which means this thing here is most certainly not a function. But at the same time, if we look at this remark here, we can say uh, the unit circle may be described by f of x, y equals 1, right? Where x and y are, of course, just real numbers, and f of x, y is x squared plus y squared, i.e. an implicit function. So in other words, it is possible to just think of this as a function in its own right. Here, you may raise the objection that, well, is an implicit function an actual function? Does it satisfy the definition of a function? And I would say to you, it very certainly does. The reason why it does is because for whatever x you pick and for whatever y you pick, when you put those numbers into this right hand side, you will only get one number as an outcome. You will not get multiple numbers as outcomes. Whereas if you pick an x and put it into this formula here, you will get two numbers as outcomes, right? So certainly the implicit function is very clearly uh, a function, whereas this formula here is very certainly not a function. So we know that there's a way of thinking about the unit circle as a proper function, but the question is, is this the best way? So is the implicit function way the best way of thinking about uh, the unit circle as a function? And the answer is no, it's not. In fact, there's a much better way, and it's the concept of parametric functions, right? And we will move on to define what parametric functions are and look at some examples now. We're finally in a position to be able to see the definition of a parametric function. It's essentially given in sort of a schematic here, but I'll, I'll go through the definition, which is what we actually have is we have a function 
which has real numbers as inputs. But upon putting in those real numbers, what we have coming out are actually points in the XY plane. OK, so that's the characteristic essence of what a parametric function is. So you put in some real numbers and you get out not real numbers, but you get out points. Right. And in terms of formulas, the way we actually describe this is we put in some real numbers called T and then we get out some points, which are obviously going to be like a coordinate. And generally, uh, because it's a function, then we need a, a sort of a function for the X part of the coordinate. And we also need a function for the Y part of the coordinate. And those functions in themselves are just real functions. So I've just said that there. So the X can be a real function of T and the Y itself can just be a real valued function of T. OK. Now, if this looks a little bit uh, sort of complicated, again, I would sort of say the same thing as I said in the previous video on implicit differentiation, which is uh, this might look a bit messy, but when we actually come to doing lots of examples, you'll see this is dead easy. And in fact, in many ways, it's much easier to be able to even understand the ideas much better in that sort of way, as opposed to doing a lot of abstract stuff. Let's take a look at the remarks. So the first remark is parametric functions are more often expressed in the form uh, this form here. OK, so this is the convention on the A-level syllabus, which is what we write down is rather than writing uh, one function and sort of uh, X and Y as a pair of coordinates. We just write down X equals some function of T and then we write down Y equals some other function of T. And because we don't want to be introducing sort of new symbols here, we just say that the function that X is representing, we'll just call X of T and the function that Y is representing, we'll just call Y of T. And of course, we need to specify uh, what values of T are allowed as inputs into our function here and here. OK, the second remark is the interesting thing to notice is the parametric function is actually just a function of one variable. And that's a really, really important fact. Whereas when we were dealing with implicit functions, they were functions of two or more variables. So in that regard, parametric functions are actually much, much simpler things to be handling uh, than implicit functions. The third remark I would like to make is every explicit function, so basically the vast majority of functions we've seen on the A-level syllabus so far, can actually be expressed in the parametric form, right? And here's a way of doing it, which is if you're given an explicit function, so you've got y equals f of x, where x is defined uh, sort of for real numbers, then what you can say is let me just take x to be t, and that's going to be my first function. And then because X is T, I can just come back to this description here and replace that X by T. And that gives me a description for Y as a function of T. Right. So my Y of T function can actually be written like that. So we've been able to go from something which is an explicit function to now something which is uh, a parametric function. The last remark I would like to make is that there are actually very deep connections between uh, implicit functions and vectors and parametric functions. Uh, but really, for our purposes, we need not get into this. Before jumping into examples and actual sort of processes for differentiating parametric functions, the first thing is you should notice that the definition of parametric functions given here actually defines something which is a technical function. So what do I mean by that? I mean, for each input, there is only one output. We're not getting multiple outputs out in this case, because if we look at how X is defined and how Y is defined, this thing X of T here is a function and this thing Y of T here is a function, which means for each input T, we only get one output here. And for each input T, we only get one output here. So therefore, when we come to this function here, for each input T, we only get one output for a point. OK. The second point would be we've had to do all this work, but there is really a big payoff because parametric functions allow us to write down these sorts of things, which are called parametric equations casually. And parametric equations are completely out of this world. They allow us to get graphs for certain curves, which explicit functions will actually never, ever be able to do. OK. And the third thing is we've had to do all this emphasis on the concept of functions. And the reason for that is, is because the concept of differentiation is built on the concept of a function. So if we don't have something which is a function, it doesn't even make any sense to ask what's its derivative. So example one, uh, we're required to be able to graph a parametric function that we're given. 
Of course, we know that we're going to get a unit circle coming out of this, but let's actually work through the, the mathematics and, and see that formally. So uh, I can write down the parametric equation in this case. I can say x is basically cos of t, and I can say y is sine of t. That should not be surprising because my x coordinate for the function is cos t, so I have that there, and my y coordinate for the function is sine t, so I have that there. And I should also say that my t, I'm told, is going to be between 0 and 2 pi. So at this stage, we have lots of ways forward in being able to graph this. Uh, the easiest way, perhaps one that some might say, is to write down t and then to write down x and also to write down y. Okay. So say if I pick t to be 0 and then I pick t to be pi by 2 and then I pick t to be pi and 3 pi by 2 and maybe say 2 pi. Right. And what I might then do is go to this function x and actually write down what the x value is going to be. So cos of 0 we know is going to be 1. Uh, cos of pi by 2 is going to be 0. Cos of pi is actually going to be minus 1. Cos of 3 pi by 2 we're back at 0. And then cos of 2 pi is of course the same as cos 0 which is 1. And we repeat the exact same thing for the other one. So if we put t equals 0 in there, well, what's sine of 0? Sine of 0 is just 0. And then what is sine of pi by 2? Sine of pi by 2 is just 1. So we write, we write 1 down. What is sine of pi? Sine of pi is actually also 0. What is sine of 3 pi by 2? Well, that's minus 1. And what's sine of 2 pi? That's again 0 which means if we actually write down our coordinates, the first coordinate is actually going to be 1, 0, right? Because we, we see that here, x is 1, y is 0. Uh, the second coordinate is going to be 0, 1. So I write that down. My x is 0, my y is 1. My third coordinate is going to be minus 1, 0. So we write that down. So we have minus 1, 0. The fourth coordinate is going to be 0, minus 1. So we write that down. 0 minus 1 and obviously the fifth coordinate is going to be 1 0 right so I, I write that down so here we have it in fact uh, our list of coordinates here this is what we're going to be plotting of course if I actually wanted I could go back and put in lots more different values for t and get lots of other coordinates and then we can just go plot all those coordinates and just join them up with some sort of a line getting some sort of a curve but in this case we see that let's let's do it here that the first coordinate here is actually this thing here, right? And then the second coordinate here is actually this thing here. And the third coordinate here, which is minus 1, 0, is going to be this point here. And the fourth coordinate here is going to be 0, minus 1, so it's just going to be minus 1 on the y-axis. And the fifth coordinate, because uh, it's t equals pi by 2, and strictly pi by 2 is not included in my definition of t, I don't actually need to plot this. But what you, what you will find is if you, for example, pick different values of t, say, in between uh, 0 and 2 pi, you will find that you'll get coordinates on this sort of part of the curve, this sort of part of the circle, okay? And, and likewise, if I go where and they maybe change colour, if I pick t to be between pi by 2 and, and pi, you will find that we'll actually, we'll actually get coordinates in this sort of part of our circle. And the same idea just carries on. So if I, if I go pick t between pi and 3 pi by 2, you can come and plot those. And you'll find that they'll actually be uh, somewhere in between here. And, and lastly, we sort of come back. And when we pick t between 3 pi by 2 and 2 pi, you'll find that, in fact, when you, when you plot those points, you'll get things sort of in between here. Right. So, so what I should perhaps say is this is the start. And this happens at t equals 0, and then it goes all the way around. And this point here also happens to be the end, and that happens at t equals 2 pi. There is an alternative solution, so let me, let me write that down. The alternative solution is more analytic, which is to say, well, I've got x, and I know x is cos t, and I've got y, and I know y is sine t. Then how about we eliminate t, right? So eliminate t to get a Cartesian equation. In this case, you'll find that actually it's going to be quite awkward to eliminate t without using the identity cos squared t plus sine squared t equals 1. So we know that this identity is true, 
But what do we know? Well, we know that our t uh, cos t is x, so we, we can just come and say we can replace the cos squared t uh, with basically saying x squared. And we also know that our, our sine is basically y, so we can replace our sine squared t with y squared. And of course, the one on the right hand side just remains. So what this actually tells us is we can eliminate uh, the variable t from our set of parametric equations to get a Cartesian equation. And this Cartesian equation will describe what our, what our curve looks like. And lo and behold, this is exactly the equation of a unit circle uh, centered at zero. So we actually get the curve that we actually had already. Let's quickly think about parametric differentiation. So suppose that we're given some sort of a parametric curve in the form of a set of parametric equations, right? Where obviously there's a limitation on t, where t is the parameter, and then x and y are my x and y coordinates, right? So the question is, how do we actually find out the derivative of y with respect to x? And the answer is, you just use the chain rule. Right? And this is dead easy because we see that dy by dx is going to be dy by dt times by dt by dx. And it's the t that's actually making the chain here. Even though this is completely good enough for us to work out the derivative dy by dx, the convention is to be able to write this in a slightly different way. And what we actually do is we use something called the reciprocal rule, which is if you want to work out dt by dx, then one way of doing it is to actually work out dx by dt and put one over. Right. We've already seen the proof of something like this. Uh, it was probably done a few videos ago. Please do go back and take a look if you're not too sure where this has come from. But the point is, using this statement here, we can go and replace this dt by dx by 1 over dx by dt. And therefore, we can just write down our dy by dx as dy by dt divided by dx by dt. And of course, this formula is only valid for whenever the denominator is not equal to zero. So basically, we've seen all the material that we actually wanted to cover in this video now. So the only thing we're going to now do is just do lots of examples of application of this sort of thing. OK, example two is a very standard sort of question. We're just given some sort of parametric curve and we're asked to find the derivative. So let's quickly work out the derivative. We know that to work out dy by dx, we need to work out dy by dt and we need to divide that by dx by dt. And we need to make sure that dx by dt is not zero for the values of t that we're actually considering, right? So in this case, we know that our x is t. And so that tells us that dx by dt is 1, right? And we know that our y is t squared. And that tells us that dy by dt is actually 2t. So together, what this tells me is actually my dy by dx is going to be 2t over 1. Right? And this is obviously defined for all t since the denominator is never going to be zero. So we've actually managed to work out our derivative. Perhaps it's better to write the derivative out uh, just explicitly like so. And it might also be worth doing a quick check. Well, we can go back to our, to our function or to our parametric curve. And we can say, let us write this in Cartesian form. Right, so we want to convert this back to x, y form. How are we going to do that? The answer is we're going to solve this simultaneously and eliminate t. Right, so since I know x is t and I know y is t squared, I can directly actually say y is actually equal to x squared. That's a very simple, simple argument. And then now that I know y equals x squared, I can actually differentiate this directly. And I can say, therefore, dy by dx is 2x. But of course, last time we got our answer in terms of t. So if we want to write this in terms of t, we already know that x is t. So I can come back here and say, this is just 2t. So hopefully this should convince you that parametric differentiation works. Example three, we have uh, another parametric equation. And we again want to just find its derivative. So we're just going to do the exact same thing which is we want dy by dx, and we know that the way to get it is to do dy by dt, and then to divide that dx by dt. And we've just got to be careful to make sure that dx by dt is not zero for certain values of t. So uh, here, we've got y is log t. So since that's the case, we know that dy by dt is going to be 1 over t, the derivative of a log function is a standard function. 
and x is equal to e to the t minus 5, and then differentiating x with respect to t is actually going to give me e to the t, right? And of course, uh, this is always going to be positive for all t, uh, for all t positive, then what I can say is my dx by dt is always positive. So in other words, it's never zero. So I can actually come back and I can, I can say that my dy by d x is going to be 1 over t divided by e to the t, which of course is just 1 over t e to the t. And I don't have to worry about t being 0 because initially we were told that t has to be bigger than 0. So I can just come here and say t bigger than 0. Let's do a quick check to make sure our answer is sensible. So we start with our parametric equations, right? And then we want to be able to get the Cartesian form, which means we have to eliminate this t. And we basically just rearrange so that we can get rid of the t in here, which means if I can get a description for t, I'm basically home. So I go to this equation and I say I add 5 to both sides to get x plus 5 equal e to the t. And then I inverse the exponential function, so I take the logs of both sides to give me a log of x plus 5 is equal to t. So now that I have this, I go and put this into here, and I get y equals log of log of x plus 5. So we actually have an explicit description for our for function. And then we can sort of go away and differentiate this. This is a standard sort of thing we should now be able to differentiate. And you'll find that the answer you'll get is 1 over x plus 5 times my log of x plus 5. But of course, x plus 5 is just e to the t, so that thing here becomes e to the t, and log of x plus 5 is just nothing other than t. So that thing here just becomes t, and we actually get the exact same answer. Okay, so let's move on to the next example. Example 4, we're given a parametric equation, and we have to work out, obviously, its derivative, but we're now given a specific point at which we've got to work out the derivative. Okay, so if we really wanted to see what this looks like, we could actually go away and plot this uh, much like we've done in example one. Uh, but for now, for purposes of time, let's just jump into the calculation because the calculation is easy enough. So we basically say we want dy by dx and we know we're going to get it by doing dy by dt and dividing that by dx by dt. And obviously dx by dt better not be zero. So we need to find our dy by dt and dx by dt. So we basically go back to our equation. We say x equals tan t. Well, that tells us that dx by dt is just a standard derivative. The derivative of tan is sec squared. And likewise, we say y equals 2 sine 2t. Two and again, we, could, we can differentiate this directly. And that's another standard derivative. We're going to get 4 cos of 2t. So if you're not too sure how these derivatives are worked out, please go back and look at sort of work on previous videos. So coming back to dy by dx, I know my numerator is going to be 4 cos uh, 2t, and my denominator is going to be uh, sec squared t. Right, But since uh, sec squared is actually nothing other than 1 over cos squared, then the whole thing can be simplified to say 4 cos squared t cos 2t. And of course, I shouldn't have put a power of 2 here, but that's just unnecessary. So we've actually got our derivative. So at this stage, our temptation would be to, to come to dy by dx and to insert our point. So what's our point? Our point is, of course, 1, 2. But the problem is that's the x value, 1, and 2 is the y value. And our entire derivative is actually in terms of t. It's not in terms of either x or y. So what we actually want to do is we want to find out the actual value of t, which corresponds to the point uh, 1, 2, right? So we can find our t. So let's, let's do it here. Find t at point 1, 2. So we know that x is 1 but we also know that x is uh, tan t, right? So that basically tells me that my, that my tan t has to be 1, and we can indeed solve that equation. So say t is equal to the tan inverse of 1, which happens to be pi by 4. And the good news is uh, pi by 4 actually is perfectly between 0 
and pi by 2. So we know that as a solution this would actually work, but the point is we must check whether t equals pi by 4 will actually give us y equals 2 as well, because so far with the work we've done we know it works for x, but we don't know if it works for y. So I'll come back here and say y equals, well, what is y? It's 2 sine uh, 2t, our t is pi by 4, but then 2t is pi by 2. So we say this is going to be 2 times by sine of pi by 2. Of course, sine pi by 2 is 1, so the answer actually works out to be 2. So this tells us that t equals pi by 4 is actually the right answer, because when we stick it in, we get the right values for x and y. So we come back and we say t equals pi by 4 which basically means we come back to our to our formula for our derivative and we stick in pi by 4 everywhere, right? Cos of what 2t is going to be pi by 2, obviously. So at this stage, we notice that we know cos of pi by 2 is going to give us 0, which means we don't really care what cos of pi by 4 is going to give us, and the whole thing is just going to give us 0. So we've been able to work out the derivative at the point 1, 2 on our parametric curve. Example 5, uh, we again have the exact same parametric equation actually, the exact same parametric curve, but now the question is a little bit different. The question is asking us to work out all the stationary points, right? So uh, we know that the key idea here is uh, all stationary points satisfy dy by dx equals 0 to satisfy this condition, so we actually have to work out what dy by dx is. But the good news is we worked out dy by dx for this exact parametric set of equations in the in the last example. So we know that our dy by dx is actually just going to be 4 uh, cos squared t times by cos 2t. So to say that dy by dx equals 0 is the exact same thing as to say that 4 cos squared t cos 2t actually is going to be 0. Well, that then tells me I must have two possibilities. I must either have cos of t being equal to 0, or I must have cos of 2t being equal to 0, right? Because clearly the 4 is non-zero, so either this thing here is 0, and that all that thing there is 0. But if that thing there is 0, we've said that perfectly there. But if this thing here is 0, then obviously cos of t itself has to be 0. So really, it's just a matter of solving equation 1 and equation 2, right? If we look at them more generally, they're both of the form cos theta is actually equal to 0, right? So let's look at the cos curve, and let's figure out when is cos theta actually going to be 0. So let me say cos theta on top here. So the cos curve does something like, like that, obviously, and it's going to keep looping. And since we're only interested in values between sort of 0 and pi by 2, I don't have to look at the entire cos curve. So in particular, I can just look at the first few values here, right? Because I only want positive values. So let's look at this one. We know that's going to be pi by 2. And let's look at the other one. And we know that's going to be 3 pi by 2, right? So coming back to sort of equation 1, we can actually say equation 1 tells me that t is going to be either pi by 2 or t is going to be 3 pi by 2. And of course, there are other solutions, but we don't really care about them too much. And equation 2 tells me the exact same thing, but now it says 2t is going to be pi by 2, or 2t is going to be 3 pi by 2, right? And we have a lot more solutions. So at this stage, we've got to keep in mind that our t overall has to be between uh, 0 and pi by 2. So that alone tells me that I can completely disregard these solutions here, because these are bigger than pi by 2. However, case 2 actually simplifies to tell me that t can actually be anything like pi by 4 or 3 pi by 4 and so on and so forth, right? So at this stage, it is worth checking whether any of these solutions make sense. Clearly, 3 pi by 4 does not make any sense because it's bigger than pi by 2. And actually, pi by 4 does make sense because it's, it's perfectly within the sort of limit that we want t to, t to be in. So what we can say is we can say uh, solution is, so solution at t equals pi by 4, right? And we can go back and we can put t equals pi by 4 into our parametric equations. And the point we actually work out, this shouldn't surprise you because we worked out t equals pi by 4 in the last example, is actually going to be the exact same point as what we worked out in the last example, which is 1, 2. 
So what we've been able to show is, in fact, in this case, uh, 1, 2 is the only stationary point which actually lies uh, on, this, on this parametric curve. Okay. Example 6, we have a very standard problem from the A-level syllabus, which is to find a tangent to a curve at a given point. But obviously, the slight catch here is everything is in parametric form. So let's take a look at a solution. Uh, of course, we need to know what the derivative is going to be or what the gradient is going to be. So we work that out using the result we've already seen. So I write that down where obviously dx by dt better not be zero for the value of t that I'm working with. But in this case, since our x is log of tan of t, then this is a standard sort of thing to differentiate by now for us. And the answer is just going to be 1 over tan t, and then the numerator is going to be the derivative of the tan function, which is obviously the sec squared function. And we might want to tidy this up. So the sec squared is going to be 1 over cos squared t, and then the tan is obviously going to be sine over cos, but I can sort of play around with this and write this as cos t over sine t, which is obviously the same as uh, 1 over sine t cos t. We now turn our attention to the y. y is 2 sine 2t. And this is, again, a very standard thing. And we know that the derivative is actually going to be 4 cos 2t. right? So we can now write down dy by dx. Well, my numerator is going to be dy by dt, which is just 4 cos 2t. And my denominator is just going to be dx by dt, which is going to be 1 over sine t times by cos t which of course can be simplified and written as 4 sine t cos t cos 2t. We need to evaluate dy by dx at x equals 0, but the problem is our function is purely in terms of t, so we actually need to figure out what the corresponding t is, right, when x is 0, and we can sort of do this on the side here. So x equals 0, and x equals log of tan t, well, that tells me that log of tan of t is actually equal to 0, which tells me tan of t is actually equal to e to the 0, which is, of course, just 1. And so t has to be the inverse of 1, which is, in fact, pi by 4. And the good news is pi by 4 is perfectly in between 0 and pi by 2. So that's perfectly sensible. So in fact, we just go back and we say our t is going to be pi by 4. We put this in. So we say 4 sine of pi by 4 cos of pi by 4. And of course, the cos of 2t is going to be the cos of pi by 2. And this is where we know that this term here is going to be 0 because cos at pi by 2 is 0. And therefore, the whole thing here would just become 0. In other words, our tangent is actually going to be horizontal. And that's actually quite reassuring because our x coordinate is 0. So if we actually come to our graph here, this is the graph of our parametric curve. We see that at x equals 0, which is the y-intercept, so if I say at that point, what's the tangent going to look like? The tangent is just going to be a horizontal line, okay? Which tells me that the, that the gradient is actually 0, and that's precisely what we've worked out here. So uh, without much ado, we can actually just write down the equation of tangent. So the equation of tangent, it's just going to be the y value of the curve, which is going to be sine of 2t evaluated at t equals pi by 4. So 2t will actually be pi by 2. And of course, sine of pi by 2 is 1. So 2 times 1 is just going to give me 2. So this is my equation of my tangent. And this is, of course, consistent with what I've got there, since the point there is actually y equals 2, right? We can move on to the next example. Example 7. This is quite an interesting example. So we're given a curve, and the curve has uh, the following parametric equation. And what we have to figure out is we have to figure out the tangent line, or rather the point at which the tangent line to this curve is actually going to be parallel to the y-axis. OK, so this is something we would not have seen previously with the Cartesian equations. But in this case, it will be quite interesting to work through. So let's let's jump in. Of course, since we're interested in, in the tangent, then we need to work out a gradient. 
So we, we, we work out dy by dx, and we do it in the exact same way that we've been doing it so far, which is dy by dt over dx by dt, where dx by dt better not be zero, okay? So uh, obviously our y happens to be uh, four tan of t, which tells me that dy by dt is actually four sec squared of t, and our x happens to be one plus two sine squared t. It differentiates to give uh, four sine t cos t. So putting this sort of together, we can actually say that dy by dx is actually going to be four sec squared t over four sine t cos t. And we can obviously cancel out the fours because they're exactly the same, top and bottom. And in fact, by using the definition of what sec is, so we know sec is one over cos, we can actually rewrite the whole thing as uh, one over uh, sine t cos cubed t, because I get a cos squared from the sec squared, and there's already a cos there in the denominator to begin with, so I actually end up with cos cubed in the denominator. So we have our gradient. Now, the important thing here is we want the tangent to be parallel to y-axis. Well, if a tangent's going to be parallel to the y-axis, I hope it's pretty clear just visually that for this curve that we have here, it's actually going to be at the point 1, 0, right? So if I do a tangent here, then that tangent's basically going to be parallel to the y-axis. But the interesting thing is what happens when a tangent is vertical? So we say uh, vertical line has gradient of infinity. And how can we possibly get infinity out of uh, our derivative? Well, one way of getting infinity out of our derivative is if our denominator is actually zero. So we can say that might actually be the case. So perhaps I should do these arrows to sort of let us know that, uh, that this point implies that point, and that point implies the fact that the denominator has to be zero in our, in our derivative. And of course, at this stage, we know that either uh, sine t has to be equal to zero uh, or uh, cos t has to be equal to zero. OK, so we can solve both of these for t. So indeed, uh, the first one would tell me t is equal to actually sine inverse of zero, which is going to be, well, zero, pi, two pi, and there are infinitely many solutions. And the second one tells me t is actually equal to cos inverse of zero, and that's obviously going to be at pi by two, at three pi by two, and so on. However, before we can actually decide which value of t is suitable, we've got to go back and take a look as to what the conditions on, on t actually were. So t has to be between pi by two and three pi by two, which basically means it can't be either one of these solutions, and it also can't be either one of those solutions, right? Because all of those are technically outside of that region. So in fact, it has to be that t is actually pi, right? So we say except t equals pi as a solution. And what we find is the point that we're actually interested in is going to be, we're going to have to put t equals pi in, into here and into here. But when we put pi into x, what we actually get is sine of pi is 0. So 1 plus 2 sine squared of pi is just going to be 1. So we get x to be 1. And likewise, we go to y. We say 4 times by tan of pi. Well, tan of pi is actually also 0. OK, so 4 times 0 is just going to give me 0. So what I'm going to have is I'm just going to have 0. So indeed, our initial sort of uh, intuitive guess of the fact that 1, 0 was the point where the tangent was going to be parallel to the y-axis uh, works out to be actually true. So let me write down the equation of tangent, right? And of course, the equation of tangent just works out to be x equals 1. The next example requires us to work out the equation of a normal to a curve with this parametric equation at a, at a given point. 
So let's jump in. So what are we going to need? We're going to need gradient and we already have a point. So given that the point is OK, we're going to work on the gradient. So I need dy by dx. But again, we work it out by using the sort of thing we've already been doing. So we write that down and we make sure that uh, dx by dt is not zero for the various values of t we're looking at. And in this case, since uh, x equals 4 sine t, uh, then dx by dt is just going to be uh, 4 cos t. And likewise, if y equals 2 cosec 2t, then dy by dt actually works out to be minus 4 cosec 2t cot 2t. Again, these are standard derivatives, but if you're not quite sure, uh, do go back and take a look at previous videos. Uh, the derivative of a cosec has certainly been covered, okay? So of course, we can just go back and substitute things into the formula. So the numerator just becomes minus 4 cosec 2t cot 2t, and the denominator is nothing other than 4 cos t, and obviously we can cancel the 4s out, so we actually end up with this. But of course, uh, we want to evaluate uh, the derivative at the point, but our point is given in terms of x and y, so it's 2, 3, and 4 thirds root 3. But the problem here is our function is actually given in terms of t. So as before, we actually need to find the corresponding t so that we can actually go to our dy by dx and put in that value of t, right? So let me do that on the side here. So I say finding corresponding value of t. So what do we know? We know that x is 2 root 3 at our point. And we also know that every x coordinate is given by the function for sine t. OK, so since that's the case, we better have 2 root 3 be equal to 4 sine t. And that then tells us that our sine t has to actually be equal to root 3 over 2, which tells us we can take the inverse function. So our sine inverse of root 3 over 2 is actually going to give us a value for t. But the problem here is sine has infinitely many solutions. So we actually get an infinite list of solutions. And I'm just going to tell you what the solutions are. You can sort of check these for yourself by putting them into the equation. So we have that. Now, we're not going to know how to decide which solution is going to be the right one here. So what we have to do is we also have to go repeat the entire argument for actually y. So now I say uh, my y is actually 4 thirds root 3. But of, of course, my y is uh, 2 cosec 2t. And then that tells me that 4 thirds root 3 has to be equal to 2 cosec 2t. But 2 cosec 2t, of course, I should actually say in green maybe, is nothing other than 2 over sine 2t, which then means I can sort of rearrange this all in one go. I can say uh, 3 over 4 root 3 is actually the same thing as sine 2t over 2, right? Of course, all I've done is I've just flipped that fraction, and then as a result, I flipped this fraction. So if I flip one side, I'm allowed to flip the other side, okay? So coming back, I can rearrange this, and I can say that's exactly the same thing as sine of 2t actually being equal to 3 over 2 root 3, we can rationalize the denominator, and this just works out to be root 3 over 2 again. So at this stage, we basically have to go solve this equation here, but we know what the solution is going to be. I'm just going to say 2t is basically going to be equal to sine inverse of root 3 over 2, right? But I already have a list of solutions for root 3 over 2, which is what we worked out here. So what I'm going to get here is just going to be the same list. So it's going to be pi by 3, 2 pi by 3, and dot, 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 all the other infinitely many solutions. But of course, I should keep in mind that all these solutions here are actually not for t. They're actually for 2t. So if I actually wanted t, perhaps I can, I can sort of write it here in red now. t is going to give me, I'm going to have to divide every single solution here by 2. So the pi by 3 turns out to be pi by 6. 
and the 2 pi by 3 turns out to be pi by 3 because the 2 gets cancelled when I divide by 2 and then there's another infinitely many solutions. So now I have to pick a solution which is both in this list as well as in that list, right? So uh, unsurprisingly, pi by 3 is actually going to do the job for us, okay? So uh, let's make a bit more room and check that pi by 3 is actually the right solution and then we can work towards working out the gradient. So in fact, I've, I've already made a quick summary of uh, all the key points from the, from the previous uh, screen. Uh, our point is uh, 2 root 3, 4 thirds root 3. Uh, our curve is exactly what we had before. And we know this is our derivative. And our value of t that we worked out was pi by 3. And the check for the fact that t equals pi by 3 does actually give us the right value for x and the right value for y namely 2 root 3 and 4 thirds root 3 is actually here. Feel free to sort of put these numbers in yourself just to make sure things make sense. It is also good to see that our value for t actually lies within the interval 0 to pi. So at this stage, we can actually go back and evaluate our, our derivative at t equals pi by, pi by 3. But of course, the numerator here has 2t, so I'm going to have negative cosec of 2 pi by 3 and then cot of 2 pi by 3, but the denominator is just going to be the cosine of pi by 3. These are all very, very standard sort of trig uh, inputs, and I can actually tell you that you can put this in a calculator, and you should find that the cosec evaluates to give you 2 over root 3, the cot evaluates to give you negative 1 over root 3, and the cos actually evaluates to just give you a half, and we can, of course, sort of tidy this up. The two negatives here are actually going to cancel and just go away. And then I'm going to have a 2 multiplied by 1, which just gives me a 2. So I write that down. And I'm going to have uh, a root 3 multiplied by another root 3. And root 3 times root 3 is just 3. So I have a 2 thirds on the top. And then the bottom is just a half. And that, of course, can be simplified to give you 4 thirds. OK? So uh, this is basically our, our gradient, right? So this is going to be our gradient of tangent. And we know from material covered in year one that our gradient of normal is actually going to be uh, negative one all over gradient of tangent. And of course, given our gradient of tangent is 4 thirds, our gradient of normal works out to be negative 3 over 4. So we have our value for m, and we actually have our point, right, which is 2 root 3 and 4 thirds root 3. So we're actually in a position to be able to write down the equation of normal. Of course, all we have to do is just go to y equals mx plus c and use the fact that we know what m is, we know what x is, which is obviously there, and we know what y is, which is obviously there, and basically work out c. Now, in the interest of time, I won't actually do the entire calculation. The video is long enough as it is, but I will write down the answer. So the answer you should get once you've done the entire calculation you should actually get the value of c to be 17 over 6 root 3. So the equation actually works out to be minus 3 over 4x plus 17 over 6 root 3. With that, and in the presence of some uh, very, very beautiful looking parametric curves, I'd like to bring this video to an end. I'd like to say thank you for watching. Uh, we hope you found the video useful. Do let us know in the comments section as to what you would like to see more videos on. Do hit the like and subscribe buttons and we will see you in the next video.